that probably would be obvious to most of you, the Study Bible has a treatment of all these texts that relate to eschatology in the notes in the Study Bible, the commentary series on the New Testament. You'll find the larger prophetic passages such as Mark 13 and um, the Luke passages 17 and 21, Matthew 24, 25, and uh, other passages uh, in the other New Testament commentaries, the book of Revelation for one covered in much, much more detail. And uh, they have reissued a, a book I wrote called The Second Coming, which uh, gives you a more thematic look at the events of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I only say that because I, I don't uh, expect that I'll be able to cover everything, but somewhere if you uh, search far and wide, you'll find the answers to the questions that are, are raised in your mind as we look at the Word of God together. Well, with that being said, we come this morning to this wonderful seventeenth chapter of Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 17, and our theme is the second coming of Jesus Christ. We are dealing with verses 22 through verse 37, Luke 17, 22 through 37. This is a prolonged presentation of our Lord's second coming that comes from His own lips. You might say this is Jesus on His second coming. We are hearing it straight from the Lord Himself. It is not a presentation of the chronology of His second coming or the sequential events. There will be a more sequential chronological presentation by our Lord in the twenty-first chapter of the gospel of Luke. But here we have not a chronological treatment of His coming, but a description of it. This is to help us with the nature of that event. And in one particular aspect, and that is that it will be a judgment. While we as believers look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ because it will bring Him glory and because He will establish His kingdom on earth and He will bind Satan and righteousness and truth and peace will prevail over the earth as He reigns literally and physically in Jerusalem over the world. And that's all positive and that kingdom will be launched only with those who are the Savior's own by faith. We look forward to that. We look forward to the kingdom aspects of Christ's return. We long for that day when we will reign with Him and enjoy the fullness of all the blessings and promises originally given to the patriarchs and to David and even to the prophets in the New Covenant. But that's not all that occurs in the second coming of Christ. It's not just the kingdom and glory and blessing and prosperity and righteousness and peace prevailing in the earth. Before that happens, there will be the most horrific, consummate, complete, devastating judgment the world has ever or will ever know. And so as our Lord talks about the second coming in this particular text, it is a focus on the judgment. It is looking at the nature of His return as a judgment event. This is all precipitated by the fact that Jesus talked about the kingdom all the time. He preached about the kingdom all the time. And in a mocking, scoffing way, uh, the Pharisees say to Him in the query that is certainly in their minds, if not on their lips, verse 20, when is the kingdom of God coming? You keep talking about it. I think it's a sarcastic, scornful, mocking approach because they'd already rejected Him as their King and their Messiah. And He was such an unlikely King, He didn't appear to be the King that they had anticipated by um, all their understanding of Old Testament prophecy. There was no splendor, there was no glory, there, was, there were no signs in earth and signs in heaven of massive proportions. And He, of course, attacked their religion rather than confirming it. For all those reasons and others, they had rejected Him as King. And now I think in a mocking way, they ask, when is that kingdom that you keep talking about going to come? And He answers them 
It's not coming with signs to be observed. The first phase of this kingdom is not external, it's not universal, it's not physical. Rather, verse 21, he says, the kingdom of God is within you. The first phase of His kingdom is spiritual, personal, internal. And if you're not a part of that kingdom, you will never be a part of that external, worldwide, physical kingdom. We talked about the internal, personal kingdom, verses 20 and 21, and now we're talking about the external, visible, manifest, earthly reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. He launches, in a sense, that first kingdom in His first coming. He launches that second aspect in His second coming. It is crucial, then, to any understanding of the life and ministry of Jesus to major on the second coming. In fact, one could argue that it is the most important of all doctrines because it is the consummation of all doctrines. Every other doctrine, every other element in redemptive history ends up with the glorification of Christ in His kingdom, which is earthly and then in its final phase, eternal. You cannot minimize the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we said last time, it is a cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith. It cannot be minimized. And because it is important, it is laid out for us clearly. It is not obscure in Scripture. It's not hard to find. It is all over the place, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and with amazing specificity. Our contemporary evangelical world has become comfortable with the fact that there are all kinds of views of the second coming of Jesus Christ as if it is an absolute impossibility to understand the reality of it. In fact, books are written which share the multiple views and the multiple perspectives of almost every aspect of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as if God had not spoken clearly on the matter. So it's important for us to get a good, biblical, sound, solid look at this massively significant event, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to start with something that is very clear and very straightforward and unmistakable, let me read a verse from Acts 1 and it's verse 11. Just listen to this. Jesus had ascended into heaven. He was standing there in one moment talking with His disciples, and after He had completed what He had to say, He began to go up, just ascending into heaven by His divine power. He went up, and as He went up, they gazed intently, staring with a fixed gaze at this phenomenal occurrence, and He disappeared into the clouds. That is the ascension of Jesus described for us there in Acts 1. While they were in that startled, stunned condition of gazing at Jesus leaving, two angels appeared. And this is what the angels said, "'This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched Him go into heaven." That is unmistakable, unambiguous, crystal clear. He went up physically, bodily, literally, visibly, and disappeared behind the clouds. That is precisely the way He will come back, through the clouds, visibly, physically, bodily, literally, coming down and placing His feet on the Mount of Olives. This is not mystical, and there's no secret meaning to this. It is a promise of the literal, physical, bodily, visible return of Jesus Christ to 